right, well, let's kick off the afternoon sessions. I'd like to thank our session sponsors, RWDI Consulting Engineers and Scientists, and I'd like to invite Mike Williams of RWDI to introduce our moderate speaker, or sorry, our session moderator. <laughs> Are you a moderate speaker? Well, thanks very much, everybody. I've been warned I only have two minutes, and I'm going to try to accomplish three things. So number one, I'd really like to thank Sustainable Building Canada. <laughs> this is really one of my favorite events of the year. I look out, I see so many familiar faces. It's almost a chance for us to get back together and to talk about the things we're doing to try to make this city a better city, which I think is a really great thing. Two, I wanted to talk quickly about RWDI. I think a lot, of you, a lot of you probably know us as wind engineers, which is what we're most famous for. But my group at RWDI is focused on building performance, and our tagline for our group is where climate meets design. And so the talks this morning, I felt really validated the direction that we're trying to take our group. So if you have a master plan or a building project where you feel like you're not adequately addressing how the climate is interacting with your building, then please come and talk to us or read the handout in, in uh, your grab bag. Uh, the last piece is to introduce Mr. Peter Halsall. I only have two minutes, so I don't have much time to introduce Peter, but show of hands, who knows Peter? Perfect, the man who needs no introduction. <laughs> To both of you, put your hand up, thank you. Um, some of you may not know that I'm the uh, executive director of the Canadian Urban Institute, uh, so I've put on a different hat from my uh, engineering background. But more importantly, I would like to introduce our panel that is going to talk today about new ideas in planning and infrastructure. The essential services of a city are typically unnoticed until they fail, and, and then when they fail, the city comes to a grinding halt, so uh, all the buildings that we're talking about no longer have a purpose if the infrastructure fails. Power failures, flooding, uh, gridlock are all becoming more common and more damaging. The panel will cover new ideas on planning and delivery, delivering more sustainable and reliable infrastructure services. And the way I like to think of this is that a green building in the wrong place is not a green building, and the wrong place in large measure is determined by the sort of infrastructure that is feeding that building. So uh, it's, it's kind of the, inf uh, the underpinning or the, the, the non-structural foundations of your uh, sustainable buildings. So what I'm going to introduce the panel as a whole and, and give you an idea of what their... What their um, uh, going to talk about um, starting. Uh, I'm not, oh well, we're not even going to go in order. Sonia, second from the left, is the pre president of Sustainable Alternatives Consulting. Uh, provide green building policy research and implementation consulting services to governments, NGOs, and the private sector. She's worked on various projects to achieve the regulatory and systemic changes needed for making local improvement charges viable and to optimize their sustainability impact. She's worked with the David Suzuki Foundation, Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia government, Halifax Regional Municipality, uh, 28 Ontario municipalities, City of Toronto, including City of Toronto, Cascadia Region, Green Building Council, and CMHC. So broad perspective and will be uh, and she's currently working with Bob Baish of uh, Sustainable Buildings Canada on a, a new local uh, improvement charges uh, project and, and district energy initiative. So, uh, but, but most importantly from my well-being or for my well-being is that she practiced martial arts uh, karate for 15 years and was an instructor. So whatever she says, fine by me. <laughs> Next on the list is Nina Marie Lister. Principal of Planform and a registered professional planner. I think one of the two in the, no, you missed that this morning. There's, there's two others of you here, apparently. Um, and as somebody said, it's amazing how few planners show up to things like this, which may explain a bit of where we're at. Um, and, and at least CUIs here. Um, our background in landscape ecology and environmental planning, 
launched Plan Forum in 2006 to explore the relationship between landscape, ecology, and urbanism through an integrated design approach. She has projects in post-industrial waterfront cities, uh, Malmo and, and Stockholm in Sweden, Copenhagen, Hamburg, Melbourne, New York, and Toronto. She's an associate professor and associate director of urban and regional planning at Ryerson University and a visiting professor at U of T. Uh, her personal education, this is, this is the best of any of them, I'm afraid. Her personal education and sustainability, uh, about sustainability and resilience, uh, has been earned the hard way on a 120 acre family farm with four sons. I'm not sure which is harder, but um, she beat my mom by one. Uh, this, to treat this as a living lab for experiments with water systems, an organic market garden, free ranging chickens, and best of all, a vineyard. Uh, all with uh, uh, that, that free help and two tractors. And I'm sure the fact that she has a black belt in Taekwondo helps somewhere there, and it's certainly gonna help you today. Ask anything you want, you get. So uh, next we'll go to Nick Larson, uh, who's gonna talk about uh, the engineered infrastructure and, and how to uh, deal with the sustainability aspects of that. He's a civil engineer with a master's degree in engineering and public policy, one of maybe three in the world. It's not a lot of uh, combination there. Uh, his experience as a consulting engineer uh, focusing on assisting municipalities with a variety of infrastructure management initiatives. Uh, recently aimed at just demonstrating the relationship between sound asset management practices and the long-term sustainability and resilience of infrastructure systems. And Nick is instrumental in the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, which uh, the Canadian Urban Institute is project managing for a group of uh, industry associations representing 20, over 20 now, industry associations so that there's one uh, report on the facts about infrastructure across the country, a really neat initiative. Um, he's actively involved uh, with, the, with uh, that's just what I said. Um, and since he told me nothing personal about him, I'm gonna tell you nothing personal about him. Uh, which, you know, most engineers don't really have a personality, you know, we're kind of like that. <laughs> I are one, or I was, I'm recovering one or something. Uh, Bob Thornton, President and CEO, International District Energy Association, uh, 26 years in the district energy industry. He represents the interests of nearly 12,000 IDEA members from 26 countries, uh, 2,000 uh, IDEA members across 26 countries, so absolutely a global perspective on this. Uh, publisher of the District Energy Magazine, and uh, they, not only, the, the, for these members, there are several global conferences a year and led, up, led the growth and startup, or startup and growth, usually in that order, of three new downtown district energy systems in three different cities. Now, Rob also attended the uh, UN Climate Summit at the United Nations General Assembly in New York last week. And of all the talks about the challenges posed by climate change, he was particularly moved by the poem, of a or a video poem, of a 26-year-old mother from the Marshall Islands who pledged to send, save her seven-month-old daughter and her legacy from the unfair and ill-advised practices, something somebody this morning called them absurd, but that's uh, leading to rising seawaters. So this, I thought we'd set the tone here by showing this video that is really a moving, short moving um, poem. If we could run that. There was sound on the one I watched. We're not gonna get sound? Probably loses a lot without the poem. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> very cute, yes. Um, okay, we're gonna, we will, uh, uh, 
tried and failed, as I am told repeatedly, video and PowerPoint and, and these things, uh, this, all those wasn't that way. So what we're, we're gonna start with the um, natural side, as I said, we're gonna move on to the engineered infrastructure. Um, then we're going to uh, have uh, Rob's presentation about um, uh, district energy, so an applied uh, change to our whole thinking about infrastructure. And then Sonia's gonna tell us how we can pay for it. So starting with Nina, thank you. Nina Marie, sorry. Thanks, Peter. It's uh, awesome to me that in a room full of engineers and one or maybe two planners, the PowerPoint still didn't work. Um, <laughs> I just take some small measure of relief in that, knowing that when the technology fails today, it failed safely. Um, notwithstanding, I would have liked to hear the poem, so we'll have to watch it at a different time. I'm here to talk to you about, I think you said the natural side of things, but I think I'll make the argument today that what we have under our feet and around us is more than natural. It's a seamless condition that we've created. It is a landscape of infrastructures, both human and natural, that are now so intertwined it's difficult to tell them apart. And maybe in some ways that is where the opportunity lies. How do we integrate these infrastructures in such a way that we generate and regenerate the naturally occurring resilience that is all around us within the natural world? Living systems contain fundamentally uh, a resilient capacity. The last 25 years of ecological science has shown over and over again that their complexity and the diversity of living systems has an internally resilient characteristic. And that's something that we now need to try rather desperately to emulate and to regenerate. It's already there. So I'd like to talk about two kinds of infrastructure, not just the roads, the bridges, the sewers, and all the civil engineering infrastructure that gives us the benefits of the modern world, but also the unintended consequences of that ubiquitous design. The infrastructures of blue and green, of water and of land. And the image you see in front of you has a, those infrastructures already in a kind of tangled knot. Here's a figure ground of the infrastructure of Toronto, minus one of the watersheds, the Rouge, which is off to the east. Um, we're focusing in on the Humber and the Don here. And if you look at the foot in this diagram, uh, where the Don, 365 square kilometers of watershed drains into our bay, Toronto Bay, you can see the footprint in a kind of a mango color, orange color. And the natural bay was in the purple. So here you see what we've created. The river now flows to the west, and at one point it flowed to the east. So we have a new re-engineered mouth of the Don that has dramatic impacts on the infrastructure. It has tremendous benefits for the current city form that we see, but also some unintended consequences of that infrastructure. We share the city with other species. We sometimes forget this. We don't always love them but they too make this infrastructure their home. And so the blue and the green infrastructures I'll talk about are not just human um, in, in terms of their, the living environment, but also for other species, some of which show up on our doorsteps more often than we'd like. Um, and we don't really get to choose which of those species we share with. They are part of the urban and urbanizing fabric all around us. And this image from Canmore gives you a sense that, uh, well, it gives you a number of different perspectives, one of which is maybe it's not such a good idea to take photographs like this in rutting season. Um, maybe you want to stand back a little bit. But the landscape is shared, and so too are the infrastructures upon which we depend and those which we have made. So let's think about how we work with blue and green. In fact, a lot of people have been asking, how do we do this? There has been a call in the last 15, 10, years really for a kind of remediation approach around our infrastructure. Can we make them smarter? Can we design using water and ecological habitat in a smarter way with less unintended consequences and more capacity for resilience? Whether or not it's making them visible to people so that they understand them rather than burying our pipes, maybe we need to see them. Maybe we need to see that engineering design that treats water and does all of these, performs these functions upon which we depend in our daily life rather than hiding them, dumping them, burying them. One possibility, a landscape architect with whom I work quite regularly, Jane Wolfe, has often said, made a public plea for legibility. If we can't see something and we can't name it, we don't value it. How do we understand it? How do we make sense of it? When we pour something down the drain, do we know where it goes? So some of these images that you see on the screen in front of you are indicators of legibility, a small, simple thing to do to make and reveal what these structures do. Some of them are very ancient, by the way. The Dutch have been marking their floods for 700 years, reminding people where the water comes and where it goes. 
Uh, but we too have an infrastructure that is both buried and above ground. The Lower Don, when you look down river, you can see this armature of the expressway subsuming it to the point where um, the flow of the Don, now that it's straightened, doesn't behave like the natural infrastructure it what once was. You have this kind of collision between civil engineering infrastructure that's necessary to support the city, having made use of uh, a landscape around it to try to subsume and control it. But we know there are some problems with this approach when we don't recognize the power of the natural infrastructure around us. The rivers continue to flow. They don't look like they flow in this image, but they do. We know they move underground, we know they change the riparian or coastal habitats, and we know that in 90 seconds in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina landed in Toronto, we had major infrastructural failure, catastrophic failure. Then guess what? We noticed it. We suddenly noticed it. And we said, oh my goodness, there's a river under that viaduct and that river is continuing to move. So some attention paid to legibility and focus on these infrastructures is important. Two record-breaking floods within six weeks in 2013, we all know about these, we've heard about them, no doubt you heard about them this morning in some capacity, but my message to you is not that resilience plus, you know, is just simply a matter of dealing with storm events. Resilience is an internal capacity to living systems. This is just a reminder that they're there and we need to pay more attention to them. So we could talk a lot about resilience, and in fact, we do that. It's becoming the new sustainability. In fact, one of my colleagues at Berkeley, Christina Hill, once looked at me rather ironically and said, oh, right, sustainability plus disaster, that's resilience. That's what we're talking about. So there are policies, and now there are politics about resilience that have a lot of rhetoric embedded in them without a lot of untangling about what resilience means. And I would argue that there is a healthy science of resilience, along with a lot of non-science that is used to justify the status quo. What is resilience? Is it bouncing back to normal, a justification for having made the, the unintended cons consequences of design that we've made so far? Is, is that what it's all about? I think not. I think that there is some nonsense among that rhetoric, and it's our job to think about qualifying resilience and talking a little bit more concretely with best available evidence, with good empirical science, and with experiential learning. We don't have time to wait for perfect science. We need to act now, and so there's things we can do on a small scale, safe to fail capacity so that we don't have large scale catastrophic unintended consequences. So we can think about resilience by asking ourselves how much change is okay. We know that we're not going to bounce back to a state of normal that has caused disaster. We wanna to move to a new state of normal. So we might talk about the capacity to absorb stress to, or absorb disturbance, to reorganize within the system that we have so that we can continue to function in much the same way, but with some key differences. Think about when you recover from an illness. You feel normal again, but maybe you've achieved a new state of normal. You carry antibodies, for example, with you to the last virus you had. You have achieved a different state of normal, but yet you still feel healthy. It, it's not an analogy that is perfect, but it's a good one. We're the same, but not really the same. And more importantly, as Brian Walker has pointed out time and time again, resilience is learning how to change so as not to be changed inadvertently. That's a really important distinction from bouncing back. And so I'd argue that in the infrastructural conversations we have, redesigning our infrastructures to use living systems to harness the, the internal resilience they have is to think about their adaptive and their transformative capacity. Lots has been written about this. You've seen some of this. A nine-year study looking at social ecological systems for food supply, uh, looking at design for vulnerable systems around storm events, for example, all of which has taught us something about thinking through the tangling of social and ecological systems that allow us to plan for resilience, this focus on green and blue infrastructures. Sometimes we brand it differently. Ecological urbanism, a uh, project that came out of Harvard uh, three years ago, has provided countless examples landscape as infrastructure, reconceiving the landscape as a kind of synergistic infrastructure between the civil and mechanical engineering world and of course the natural and ecological functions. Um, and this is a fairly long tradition. We can see very simple spot examples, you know, speculative examples like how to move water off the gardener in a way that slows and holds it from the wildly creative to the very functional stormwater uh, kind of bioswales that you see here both in Toronto and also in Malmö, Sweden and the Western Harbour all throughout building developments where water is taken at surface, it's held, and it's slowed. It's also about reconceiving what we think is safe, what we think is beautiful, using water in a vertical surfaces for green parking lots, the parking lot, the most ubiquitous industrial structure that is almost designed and intended to be as boring as possible, could be a kind of a living machine. Natural swales that we cross over to enter a building, we need not always have pavement. So these are very simple examples that are well established. But looking at them on a larger scale, we see something different. We see a connected infrastructure, 
a gabion wall that isn't just about preventing erosion, but slowing and holding water. The High Line, a repurposed adaptive infrastructure that all of you by now are familiar with. Maybe we could also say it's the world's most expensive park, but it's also an incredible place that gives a different perspective of legibility around infrastructure. How much sense does it make? In areas where our cities are expanding, which by the way is just about everywhere, we run into the habitats and territories of other animals, those that are not so easy to remove from us, those that cause us danger when we uh, step out in front of them, those that pose risk to human health as much as to their own populations, populations that need to move from one side of the road to the other. What kind of infrastructures are possible for them? Well, there are actually a number of them. There are ways to make our roads safer, less divisive, less fragmented. These have been established, well established in Europe. The country of the Netherlands has more than 50 road crossings for animals, for large, um, the movement of large animals. In Western Canada, we have no less than 23 in Banff National Park. I'm working with the state of Nevada, state of Wyoming, uh, Montana, Colorado, all states that have large populations of animals moving through these communities where um, they have nowhere else to go. We're genetically isolating them. These are part of our cities. We think of these as wilderness projects, but I assure you they're not. The license plates that go under Banff National Park's bridges every day come from all over the country, and it's only two hours away from Calgary. So these are urban projects. They don't read like urban projects, but these are urban infrastructures. The Netherlands, the delta of the Netherlands below sea level, we've probably heard a lot about that in our conversations about uh, resilience and about catastrophic sea level rise. Here's a triple threat. Increased downstream flooding from the European countries, increased pavement everywhere, uh, land subsidence on the coast, a sinking coastline literally, and rising sea levels. What do you do in a country like the Netherlands? Well, there's some pretty interesting examples about how to reconceive the delta points of infrastructures that are alive, that slow and hold and reuse water, that use land as a, as a new surface on which to construct over the highways and under the highways. Reconceiving something like sea level, thinking of sea level as a gradient. Is there one single mark for sea level or does it change on a seasonal basis? Reconceiving the way we think about something increases its legibility. Students with whom I've worked on the Harvard Delta project um, have proposed everything from large oyster reefs to new introductions, reintroductions of bivalves to uh, repopulate mudflats to slow down water movement. Uh, Living Breakwater is one of the finalist entries in Rebuild by Design. Following Superstorm Sandy, some of you will no doubt be aware of the Rebuild by Design competition and an international, really a planning competition to reconceive uh, and re, re improve the coastal defense strategies around New York following Superstorm Sandys. The Living Breakwaters is but one excellent example by scape landscape architects in tandem with about 50 partners, all of which looks at using living green and blue infrastructure around the coastline to slow down and dissipate wave energy, to do so in a way that is small, experimental, using available materials, and when it fails, it's not catastrophic. So these kinds of projects are speculative, but they're also experimental. They're put into place at relatively, on an individual basis, a small scale, but collectively they can be conceived of from a planning perspective as a large scale kind of an infrastructure. Maps of parklands that are designed to flood, rather than showing the line of water as a blue line on a map, showing it as a mosaic where it moves. It's, it's a dynamic medium, it is not shown as a single line on a map. That's thinking about it differently. This example, what is this? This is a cross-sectional diagram of Toronto's wet weather flow master plan. Planners don't typically communicate like this, but this is a powerful way to say, show in section across a slope what happens when water moves. Can we think about it from the perspective of not only cost, not only point source um, release, but also slowing and holding, and what does it look like? What effect does it have on people's landscape? So reconceiving the way we think of the planning. Here we are home in the Toronto area in the Don Valley. This is we, are, we forget sometimes that we are home to 27,000 acres of natural ravine cover. We have the largest naturalized ravine system in the world. Robert Fulford has called us the accidental city that sprung up around these green corridors that serve a vital ecosystem function to the city. Do we use them smartly? Not so much, but we're starting to. We now have a variety of trail and master plans that deal with water that look at ways, again, to slow and hold the water. We also recognize the value and the services of the tree, cover, the tree canopy cover 
re restoring, for example, the riparian and edge conditions on that river, again, to provide sh shading and cooling to slow down the water, to use the water, and to, in some cases to speed it up and to move it where you need it to go. These are hydrological engineering problems, but they are also ecological problems. They're, they're design challenges. The students with whom I work at the University of Toronto and Ryerson all have, have proposed a variety of ways to intervene in the Lower Don Trail Master Plan system through bridging and tunneling, to use that river in a more creative way to recognize the services of water holding that it provides. DTAH, this is the plan for the Evergreen Brickworks. Um, it's a floodable landscape. We know that the site's going to flood, so design it to flood safely. I think uh, notwithstanding the fact that they uh, experimented on a rather large scale with their budget, having two major floods in the first year of opening was a rather dramatic learning curve. But they did simple things. Move the light switches up off the floor. When you host an exhibit, have a minimum height that's above the flood line. So really simple adaptive capacity in these buildings that allow flooding in a much safer way. I think they also learned some very important lessons about who to call to clean it up, and they learned to do it themselves, which is also an astonishing uh, small incremental learning curve. Uh, projects around the dawn vary from the wildly speculative to the common sense. Again, these are, these are uh, speculative works that have to do with ways in which to use the natural habitat cover along the edge of the ridge for both uh, human recreation and habitat creation. So you're using this as a natural asset and not um, erasing it. Uh, using the dredge aid, a, a speculative plan for the lower dons that uses the dredge to fight or remediate um, plant material and soil material, uh, creating new park spaces, and then moving that soil upstream. Again, plans for the portland, that reconceiving the mouth of the dawn, some of which are now being put into place, long-term plans, but reconceiving the mouth of the dawn in such a way that we are uh, putting the river first. This plan by Stoss, on which I, I worked for fisheries habitat, think about the river first and this build the city around the river, not the reverse. It's now time to put our infrastructure at the core of what we do, our living infrastructure, and build the engineering around it, with it, using it in a more synergistic way. Even Lake Ontario Park by um, James Corner and Associates, when we conceived this master plan, it was to use the infrastructure that it's in place. We don't need new trails, we do make use of what's already there, but by, at the same time, by enhancing the planting material, using porous paving material, changing small things in the way we do large-scale planning that has to do with harnessing the regenerative capacity of these living systems. Uh, so we, you know, we have these images, these very powerful and evocative images that show a quality of place that we can all imagine wanting to be in, and at the same time provides shoreline buffer, co coastline defense, a gradient, a gradient along the dock wall that provides habitat and holds water at bay, dissipates energy, and so on. The, this image from Waterfront Toronto emphasizes that our ravine system is part of a continuous green infrastructure. These are not points on a map that are unrelated to one another. When we step back and zoom out at scale, we see that there is a green and blue heart to the city that provides a kind of life force for us to harness in our engineering and in our planning. So if we talk about activating the resilience that is already there, this really is, comes to the agency of design. And this is not just the purview of a few specialists, it's all of our responsibility. It's planners, it's engineers, landscape architects, architects, and those professions I've forgotten, including the people who will tell us how creatively we can pay for it. None of this is done in a vacuum. What I'd argue is that we understand the ecology that is under our feet and around us as a, an already resilient infrastructure that's there for us to make use of. So this green and this blue uh, characteristic helps to also conceive of it as alive and legible, something that's important to use economically, ecologically, socially, culturally. When we link these functions across scales, we can emphasize their connectedness, that there is some element of redundancy that's important, particularly in catastrophic events, where we want to make sure their functions are protected, but we also want to see them happening at multiple scales because we need them to be adaptive in the case of change, sudden change, and transformative where necessary. We're not wiped out by a sudden change. So the agency that we seek ought to be thinking first about what are the options. Let's visualize them. Make them legible for people so that there's buy-in and we understand what can be done. Suspend conversations of cost till we get to the point where we can visualize. Then engage, all right, what, what creative strategic ways can we use to pay for these? Are there already benefits in place we can capitalize on by working together, for example? When we visualize desirable futures for place-based options, we get buy-in better. 
The process, of course, is expensive to do this. We know this as consultants. No one pays us for this kind of consultation usually. But we know that there's evidence out there for not only best practices, but what my colleague Christina Hill has called next practices. What are the next practices we're looking for in adaptive design? So seeking to learn from these happens by monitoring the experiments we put in place. And when we experiment on the ground, we have to do so in a way that's safe to fail. Let's think at a different scale and let's think about those kinds of experiments that allow us to project forward using these infrastructures in a much more creative way. Um, I encourage you to have a look at projective ecologies if you can. My colleague Chris Reed and I have assembled a rather large collection of case studies in thinking about these kinds of infrastructures that just add to the conversation. Thank you so much for having me here today. Going from Nina to Nick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so I'm the engineer in the room. I'm a pipe guy, sewer water main guy. Uh, so I've been invited here to share some of the experiences that we're having uh, within our industry. Uh, I think you'll see that it sort of mirrors where the building industry was uh, over the past 20 years, perhaps. So I want to start with, I think everyone here in this room recognizes the cover of this. This is the cover of the Brundtland uh, report where the first uh, definition of sustainability was, was given. Uh, <clears throat> the ability to meet the needs of the future without compromising the ability to meet our needs. Um, <clears throat> this is another really great high level thing. This is from the WWF report, Living Planet. So this was actually in the, in the news uh, yesterday, I think it was, they released their report again. This shows a, a plot of human development index on the bottom and an ecological footprint on the vertical axis. Uh, and what it shows is that every one of those circles is a, is a country. Uh, and what it shows is that um, no country is currently in uh, what we would call as the minimum criteria for sustainability, which means you have good human development index and you're using a small, you have a small ecological footprint. So that's Canada. And so the challenge that we have in infrastructure is how do we take Canada and reduce our ecological footprint uh, without decreasing our quality of life, uh, decreasing the services that we've got. Uh, this is a great figure that we like to show that shows what you can't see. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think this is an important figure because 80% of the value of infrastructure that a municipality owns is in fact in buried water and sewer infrastructure and water treatment and wastewater treatment facilities. So it's a huge volume of infrastructure uh, and roads. Um, so what we think about is buildings and that's been a, a, you know, something that's been a, uh, had a lot of uh, action recently. That same level of initiative has not been taken into uh, the bulk of the infrastructure that's owned by our municipalities. We've seen this, this is a bit of context. Insurance losses are huge. Uh, I know many of us are stuck in this every day. Uh, hydro, this is a nice figure that shows uh, the algae bloom in Lake Erie uh, this summer that shut down some of the water treatment plants in Ohio. So we know there's problems. Um, oops, let me go back to this. Uh, the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, which Peter mentioned and I'm involved with uh, through the Canadian Society for Similar Engineers, it has identified $171 billion worth of infrastructure in municipalities that's in fair, poor, or very poor condition. And we can say, wow, it's a giant number. Uh, but this is an opportunity. Uh, provincial and federal governments are increasing the funding that's available for municipal infrastructure to address this infrastructure that needs to be renewed. And let's make sure, uh, this is a great quote, that we don't get stuck on stupid. I think too often we hear eloquent quotes, and this is the guy who responded to the Hurricane Katrina. Um, infrastructure, particularly municipal infrastructure, lasts for multiple generations. The design life of a water main is 80 years. Uh, so that's double the typical design life of a building of 40 years. So this infrastructure is going to be there to service multiple generations, and we need to make sure as we renew it that we're thinking about how to make it as resilient and as sustainable as we can. Um, this is another piece of context. This is a picture of a gravy train. So this is particularly uh, on the bandana of the guy on the railroad track. It actually says taxpayer. Um, so this is another th issue that I think municipalities face. I do a lot of work with the municipalities. A lot of great people, uh, but there is this notion in broader society that municipalities waste taxpayers' money uh, and that everyone is out to have a free ride and, and uh, you know, things like the sunshine list don't help that. 
uh, I would argue at the senior levels in municipalities, they're drastically underpaid when compared to the private sector. Um, so this is another piece of context that I think can't be overlooked in our discussion about how we uh, improve our infrastructure systems. So these are the summary of my points. Um, renewal needs are large. Uh, climate change is impacting the design fundamentals. We've seen that this morning. I won't get into too much more detail on that. Public expectations are constantly shifting. Uh, so what we've seen, particularly in my business, I was actually out doing home visits to uh, uh, houses that have been impacted by basement flooding. Um, you know, 50 years ago, the house I bought in Toronto, people didn't live in basements. So if your basement flooded, it wasn't a big deal. Now everyone's got 50 grand tied up in their basement. So when they flood, it's a big deal. And those things change public expectations of what they expect their infra infrastructure systems to provide them. Um, we know we still have to deal with growth, both intensification and, uh, and greenfield development. And importantly, infrastructure is a slow business, uh, particularly civil infrastructure. There's a joke that it's the world's second oldest profession. I think there's probably a number of professions that claim that joke. Uh, but it is very true in the civil infrastructure business. Uh, they are resistant to change. So now I'm going to show some examples of, of municipalities that have done some great things. So I'll just let you soak in this slide for a bit. <clears throat> this is something that the city of Edmonton put together. They call it their citizen dashboard. And what they're trying to do is be very transparent about what they're trying to achieve through their infrastructure system and how well they're doing at meeting those objectives. So they report on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. On uh, There's another um, version of this. They have different categories based on the services on time performance statistics of their transit um, uh, system. Uh, so they are very transparent so that when they tell their council and their residents that they want tax increases, rate increases, they can demonstrate whether they've met what they've said they were going to do. And this is very important to combating that notion of the gravy train. Um, so this is something that when I work with municipalities, we tell them this is equally as important as making sure that you're designing your infrastructure in a different way. Um, this is something, has, has anyone here heard of the Envision Sustainable Infrastructure Rating System? Hands up. We've got a couple. Okay, great. This was a system that was developed by something called the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure of the States. It's a combination of uh, the consulting industry consulting and engineering industry, the American Public Works Association, uh, and there's another group I forget right now, uh, and a group out of Harvard called the Zoffness Group. And so the easy way to describe what Envision is, is the lead for infrastructure. So it's a series of 59 best practices about how to articulate and show what sustainable infrastructure means. So when we're doing a road resurfacing project or a water main renewal program, uh, that we can uh, apply the best practices to improve the sustainable uh, performance of that infrastructure project. And this is a quote from the director. Uh, it's to initiate a systematic change uh, to the way our infrastructure is designed, built, and operated. And I think that might sound like a lofty goal, but I think what you'll see is 20, 30 years ago, this probably looks a lot like the language that was coming out of people when LEED was started. Uh, and what you've found is that LEED has in fact permeated uh, what everyone is, understands. You know, my wife, who's a nurse, knows what LEED is um, and she knows what it's trying to achieve. Uh, I just bought a can of paint from Home Depot. I don't think you can get paint at Home Depot that's not low VOC anymore. And I would credit uh, LEED in, in initiating that change in the general, you know, just the way it is so that it's not the better way, it is just the way it's done. Um, municipalities don't like wasting money, so uh, not that there's probably a lot of consultants here that get paid to uh, sort of evaluate lead performance of a facility, but the city of uh, Fredericton in New Brunswick now asks for all their buildings to meet lead standards, but they don't require the certification because they don't want to pay the $40,000 to get it certified. But that shows that everyone wants uh, the best practices, uh, and that's the most important part. So whether it's LEED certified or not, they're doing the best practice and they're making a more sustainable uh, building. And so Envision is trying to make that happen for the rest of the 80% uh, of the value of infrastructure that's owned within a municipality. And there's this concept of doing the right project first and then doing the project right. And so that's vitally important to make sure that the planning of infrastructure is done properly. Now, some good examples. St. Charles River uh, revitalization in Quebec City. So this is, uh, has anyone heard of this project? It's a great uh, development in Quebec City. 
So anyone who doesn't like civil engineers, we gave this an award. We have an award called the Award for Governmental Leadership and Sustainable Infrastructure. Uh, and this won our award two years ago. So we recognize in our industry, uh, in, in our country, when good things are happening, uh, civil engineers are certainly there to try and recognize that and encourage uh, 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 municipal governments to uh, do more of that. Uh, this is a master plan that I was involved with. So we looked at, we've got all this existing infrastructure, pumping stations, sanitary sewers, force mains, which are the pressurized pipe that uh, conveys sewage out of a pumping station. Is there a better way? If we had to wipe the slate clean and say, how do we provide wastewater servicing in Burlington? What would we do? And how would we come up with a more sustainable long-term way of providing that wastewater service? So we came up with this approach and it lowered the life cycle cost. It looked at a long-term planning horizon on the life of the infrastructure, so up to 100 years. Um, it reduced the risk of overflows into Lake Ontario and it reduced the likelihood of basement flooding. So we really hit on what we would call the triple bottom line uh, concepts of sustainable infrastructure. It was cheaper, uh, it improved uh, uh, social uh, factors and it improved environmental performance. City of Barrie, we heard Gord Miller talk about this this morning. They are the first municipality that I know in Canada that has actually put a fudge factor to, a, uh, to account for climate change. So they had 15% multiplier on top of uh, their IDF curves when they're sizing stormwater infrastructure. And I, I can bet 15% isn't the right number. Um, but what it recognizes is there's a placeholder, uh, that they know that there's an impact of climate change and that they need to account for it as they size their stormwater infrastructure. Um, and I would also add on this point, the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card this year, a survey is gonna be going to municipalities. And we are proud of the fact that we are gonna be asking municipalities, what is their current policies around adaptation to climate change? And what infrastructure groups do they uh, apply that policy towards? Um, I, I bet the answer will be not at all for most of them, uh, but it shows municipalities that it's something they need to be thinking about. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, you know, a project that I'm sure most people in this room would drive by and not think about if they saw it in action. Uh, the region of Halton went through a road resurfacing program. They looked at some innovative uh, techniques that reduced natural resource consumption by using in-place recycling of the, of the uh, aggregates, uh, reduced the carbon footprint because it was what they called uh, warm mix asphalt, so it needs to be brought to a lower temperature, saves on energy, saves on carbon emissions, uh, reduced energy consumption, it was faster, so people weren't stuck in traffic uh, or didn't have to take a detour for as long, um, increased worker safety, and it was less expensive. So I guess you can, the, the only reason this project was approved was because it was less expensive. Um, the other benefits were, took leadership of the project manager at the region of Halton to say this is important and we want to highlight the fact that we've done this. Um, they need to sell it on it's cheaper uh, because fundamentally, I deal a lot with municipal organizations and elected representatives. When you're in front of a city council, every elected official wants to be seen as a good steward of the public purse, uh, first and foremost. So the challenge that we have is to demonstrate that the techniques that we propose are in fact the best use of money uh, if, we're, if we think that we're trying to mine the public purse. This is another one. This is Dundas Street in the region of Halton. So this is the bridge piers you see on the left-hand side with no water main on it. Those are from 1910. It was called the Tansley Bridge. It was the old bridge across Brawny Creek on Dundas Street. So they're in fact still standing. And so we went through an environmental assessment and said, well, why don't we reuse this infrastructure? Uh, and we built the water main on a bridge across it. Um, so we're reusing the infrastructure. Again, it reduced the carbon footprint of the, uh, of the, act, of the uh, construction project, uh, lower the cost, Minimal disruption of traffic, again, triple bottom line uh, factors are all hit on uh, and it's a better way of doing infrastructure. Oops. Uh, through the Canadian Society for Civil Engineers, uh, I talk a lot with academics and academics, um, I know there's academics in the room. So this is my, from a mentor I had, a good mentor said that what happens in academia is there's a lot of great ideas, throw it over the back of your head and hope it hits someone in the face who's actually uh, going to be able to implement that good idea. Um, so what I try to do when I see these things happen, when I'm involved with uh, the Canadian Society for Civil Engineers, is try to apply and share those ideas. So there's a research candidate, PhD candidate, her name is Amy Vinecore at a UNB. She's actually looked at 
uh, interviewed municipalities and said how much collaboration occurs between your engineering, your planning, your finance department, and at the same time evaluated the sustainable performance of their infrastructure system. And what she has shown is that they are they're proportional or there is a relationship between the degree of collaboration that occurs within a municipality and the sustainable performance of their infrastructure system. So what that tells us is that when we're talking about green infrastructure and parks, those people need to be in the room to say, well, if we did this, we could reduce the amount of infrastructure that we need to spend. Uh, there's some great examples in New York State about, you know, the Hudson River was, had the turbidity levels that were so high, big upgrades were required at the water treatment plant in order to uh, be able to treat the water. And instead, uh, at a dramatic cost savings, uh, trees were planted on the banks of the Hudson upstream of New York City, and it, that reduced the turbidity and deferred the need for this huge capital expenditure at the water treatment plant. So this only happens when everyone is in the same room collaborating together. Um, so I think this is a very uh, important piece that municipalities are starting to get. Um, and so one of the, uh, the leading examples that I can share with you in Canada is the city of Fredericton. So we go in there and we do something called our asset management program and asset management is really showing municipalities how they can improve the way they manage their infrastructure systems. And Fredericton has a comprehensive asset management program and you can read the quote from their chief uh, administrative officer, their head manager. Um, it has been a wild success. Uh, it has allowed them to get proper water rates and tax rates passed, uh, increases in those rates. Uh, the councillors have run elections and campaigned on the fact that they're going to raise rates and they've been elected, uh, which as anyone who again is involved in the political environment knows that never happens uh, to campaign on a tax raise. Um, so th this is a, a shining example in my mind of across Canada, what happens when collaboration occurs um, and what you can achieve. Uh, City of Fredericton requires that full life cycle cost assessments are done for any piece of infrastructure before they approve it. So little pieces like that uh, are all chipping away at this infrastructure problem that we're facing. So just to sum up my strategies, uh, changes to public policy, as Peter said, I'm probably one of the few people that has a degree in engineering and public policy, um, but they are very relevant because the, the way we decide to build our infrastructure to achieve certain policies that we're trying to, uh, to get into our municipalities is completely uh, uh, important to what uh, how that infrastructure gets built. So changes to public policy needs to happen. Uh, again, transparent decision making, innovative engineering, uh, new ways to do typical projects, uh, and collaboration. I can't speak enough about collaboration. That's why I'm happy to be here as an engineer, working with municipalities and sharing these ideas with and hearing from uh, uh, the building industry, which I know most of you are involved with. Um, and I'll just end with a bit of brevity. Um, it's a hard problem, uh, so it's only when we all work together and really uh, the collective efforts of every individual here will push us in the right direction. Um, so I'll just leave that you uh, leave you with this quote and uh, thanks. I I, I want to help you out here a bit, Nick. When, when you mentioned. Uh, and this is a dig again at us engineers, when you mentioned that the city of Barrie has a fudge factor for climate change, I can only imagine what the investment bankers would have said in your same place. It would have had four words, we would have understood none of them, and it would have had an acronym, and you'd have paid them a million bucks for it. But fudge factor doesn't do it, so come up with the next one, okay? Thanks very much. And Rob's going to talk to us about uh, something that part of infrastructure that may have evolved a little farther along the curve in terms of uh, sustainability in that district energy. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Thornton. I'm going to set my timer, but I have you there. So I told Peter I would stay on time. So I'm going to talk to you about energy, sort of the future of energy, where we are today, where we're headed. Uh, a little quick introduction about IDA and the district energy industry. The energy paradigm, it is shifting right now. What is it shifting to? I want to explain that to you. And how are we moving to a more resilient energy infrastructure for our cities? Uh, and then I'm going to give you some examples of district energy microgrids and how, you know, how they, I think, are the future of our system. 
So IDA, we were formed in 1909. We're now in our 105th year. Uh, we do have members all around the world, and essentially, you know, we try to drive change towards cleaner, more efficient energy systems in cities. Most cities have a district energy system. Uh, our other panelists mentioned that, you know, we're sort of out of sight, out of mind. And, and in fact, you know, we really are. These pipes are underground, some dating back to Thomas Edison and the turn of the century. But if, I want you to think about a district energy system as a mechanism to aggregate the heating and cooling loads of many buildings. So when you, when you have dozens or even hundreds or even thousands of buildings connected to this thermal network, you really then unleash the scale to invest in more resilient, more sustainable uh, you know, uh, production of energy. So think of, you know, aggregating the thermal loads is important. And as I mentioned, you know, these pipes are underground. We're sort of really not recognized until something goes wrong, a, a flood or, or a main break. But this is a very valuable asset for a community to have a thermal network like you do here in Toronto. You have a heating and cooling network. And you may not know, many, maybe many of you do, you take cooling out of Lake Ontario to air condition, uh, you know, 75 buildings downtown. Big investment, it cut the cost of air conditioning by nearly 90%. So a renewable asset for your community uh, and really highly resilient and highly uh, efficient. District Energy, this is a map of the US. You know, we're not that well known, but we are ubiquitous. Every major city has district energy. Most college and university campuses have a district energy system. Rather than every building having a boiler and a chiller, you centralize the production in a, in a plant and you serve those buildings through a network. Now the industry has been growing as well. Since 1990, we're nearly over uh, five and a half billion square feet. Uh, sorry, five, yeah, 570 billion square feet. Million square feet. Boy, am I ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm looking ahead too far. But here's really where we have been, and frankly, where we are. This is the DOE report, the executive summary. Our power plants in the US, and I would argue many here in Canada, waste two thirds of the fuel they consume. 67% of the energy that goes into the plant is lost as waste heat. I would argue it's not really lost. We know where it's going. We're dumping it into the ocean and the lakes and the rivers. Our, our coal fleet in the US is 32% efficient. This is what a typical power plant looks like. Most of the energy goes to the sky. This is frankly around the world. This is not a US issue. This is the energy industry, uh, you know, frankly, that we have today. And if you look at this chart, you know, my slides will be available. It, it really kind of gets to the issue that two thirds of the fuel is lost. Now, I don't know how many businesses could survive without regulatory support if two-thirds of their, their you know, product was wasted every day. I'm going to give you a case. This is important. The largest coal and gas-fired power plant in New England, Brayton Point, built in 1964, very close to where I grew up in Rhode Island. It's a coal-fired plant. Historically, it took water out of the Taunton River and released it into Mount Hope Bay every day for 50 years. In fact, 37 trillion BTUs a year were dumped into Mount Hope Bay. It's a lot of, that's a lot of energy. Now, they had to comply with EPA uh, requirements after 50 years of litigation and pay, paying a lot of lawyers. The owners, in fact, uh, you know, relented and built cooling towers. $570 million worth of cooling towers. So instead of wasting the heat into the bay, they're now wasting it into the sky. So these cooling towers are 500 feet tall. They're as tall as the tallest building between Boston and New York. They overwhelm the local area. I drive by them, I see them, they drive me crazy, frankly. But that's not the end of the story. The previous owners, this plant is now uh, at, at a loss. It was sold, it, they had to write down the plant by $780 million. And it was sold to an equity group out of New York, who are now recognizing that even they can't make it work, the plant is about to be closed. The largest generation source in New England will no longer operate. 
Now, some would say, well, this is the Obama and EPA and cut it, shutting down coal. This is an inefficient asset that never modernized. There's another way to do it. You take the heat and you put it in a pipe, like they do in Copenhagen and Sweden and, frankly, New York City. And you use it to heat your cities instead of dumping it into the, into the river or the bay. And the power plant here in Copenhagen is arguably the most efficient on the planet, burns all types of fuels, coal, biomass, gas, really, a lot of fuel flexibility, and it operates at efficiencies of 90%. It's not a technical problem. It can be done. It is being done. We're seeing, though, a change in paradigm. The, most of the generation assets that have come online now are much smaller. 25 megawatts or less. Many are renewable. Landfill gas, biomass, solar. Largely driven by public policy. And so what does this do? We, we're here really talking about more resilient cities. You know, how does a new energy paradigm support a more resilient city? Well, I, I would argue that if you shrink the size of the plant, move it closer to the load, then you, and you use the heat instead of wasting it, and you have the scale, and you have the district energy network, these connected customers, you know, then you really have a valuable asset that can adapt to fuel price and supply and carbon, et cetera. And we're moving in this direction. Frankly, our colleagues in Denmark and Sweden, they're already there. They're doing it. It can be done. And why is this important? In 1800, there was one city on the planet with a population of over a million people. One city, 1800, London. Today, there are over 200 cities with a population over a million. In fact, so the, the global planet in 1800 was one billion people. Today, we're over seven billion. 60% of those seven billion will live in cities in the next 20 years. So now, the global population that currently exists We'll all be living in cities in the next 20 years. My daughter is living in Boston. She doesn't want to live in the suburbs. So this is the challenge for cities. We can't rely on the old infrastructure of gas lines and power lines coming from 100 miles away. It will not work. We have to do something different. And I would argue that district energy, combined heat and power, microgrids are a key part of the solution. Now, extreme weather, I, I move quickly through this. We all know weather's changing. This is a, a graph of, of really what's happening. Droughts are real, and this is economic. California is under severe drought. It's also been on fire. Texas, uh, a lot of our agriculture has really been exposed to, you know, extreme weather. Last, last winter, we had the polar vortex. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> My gas bills tripled, thank you very much. But what really brought it home for people was Superstorm Sandy. Two years ago, October, this is the largest storm to hit the, the states. Uh, 820 miles in diameter, covered 21 states. It was double the size of our two largest combined. 106 people were killed. Um, eight, over 8 million people without power, and it required an army of utility workers to restore the grid. The insured loss was over $70 billion and still climbing. I mean, Manhattan took it right in the teeth, as did New Jersey, New York, uh, you know, Connecticut. Uh, I, many of you have probably seen these images, but this was the wake-up call that now our mayors are very attentive to. Our mayors who have a responsibility for resiliency and safety and the local economy are now thinking, I can't rely on that old-fashioned grid either. My grandfather's grid is no longer good enough. And so the good news is some systems stood up to Sandy. These are district energy CHP systems in the region. Nassau Energy, uh, hospitals in Hartford, Hartford Hospital, even at wastewater plant. College of New Jersey had their own district energy plant on campus and maintained operations. Fairfield University, my wife graduated from there. Also. So the rest of the town was without power. They became an area of refuge. You know, many of the kids at Fairfield live at the beach. They came back to campus, as did uh, a number of the, the people. The big story, I don't know if any of you have ever driven through the Bronx on your way to Manhattan, but there's a, a city within a city. It, it houses 60,000 people. Uh, 
it has, it has a large cogeneration district heating plant. If it were a city in New York, it would be the 10th largest in the state. So they have cogeneration, and in fact, during Sandy, they backed up the Con Ed grid. And the, their 60,000 people not only had lights, but power and heat, uh, you know, heat and cooling too. It was in October. But the real story here was Princeton University. Any Princeton grads in the, in the audience? Any Tigers? In Washington, everybody raises their hand. But. So Princeton also has a microgrid district energy system. Uh, they've seen their share of storms. A Little bit about the plant. So what they also do, they operate this, this plant, and when the price of power from the grid is cheaper, they buy it. When they can make it cheaper, they make it. So they work in conjunction with the grid, this microgrid. It always hangs up on that slide. There we go. So, but when they make power and heat, look at this graph. It's, they're twice as efficient. It, I mean, it's common sense, right? Don't waste the heat, use it. So at Princeton, that's what they do. And, and when their load you know, shifts, when they have a demand, it's, it's low. It, it really, they just respond to the market and their price. And they save millions of dollars every year with this asset. Recently, they installed 5.4 megawatts of solar PV farm. Uh, you know, they had a, a slice of land they could do this. And, and this is their electric curve on, a, on an August day. So, um, you know, the blue, I should have my glasses. Um, the blue is their cogen plant. That's how much, that's, that's their plant. But this is their, this is what they take from the grid. So Princeton, in fact, has really done a great job for themselves. But more importantly, on a hot August day, they used to have a demand on the grid of 27 megawatts. This is 150 buildings, right, on a cluster. Now their demand on the grid is two megawatts. So now they've taken a big load off the wires. It's really good for the local economy. They don't get fully paid for that. That's one of the rules we want to see changed. So when these assets generate these additional value, you know, that they get compensated uh, more fairly. So what's happening now? So we're post-Sandy. Mayors are saying to us at IDA, we want what Princeton has. We can't have our buildings shut down. We can't send our brokers home. We need a more resilient energy system in our city. So we're seeing this all over North America. Uh, and because the, this is being driven by the sustainability directors, they also want to deploy cleaner, more efficient. They want to integrate renewables. Um, and if you own the asset, it actually becomes part of your tax uh, you know, role, but it also allows you to compete for the next Google or the next Amazon who really in their corporate planning, want to locate where energy is not only highly reliable, and it's no longer price. They want to know it's resilient and clean. So mayors are now saying, we want a microgrid. We want district energy. So again, what it is, it's really this network. It's an asset. It's both power generation, heating and cooling. Uh, pretty busy graphic here for the engineers in the crowd. You'll, you kind of like this stuff. But think about, instead of having one power plant 100 miles away, in a city having six power plants. This network then can respond to price and load and sensitivity. And when you group them, you really get a, you know, a more resilient uh, asset base. Microgrids, though, are currently operating fine on our university campuses because it's a homogeneous uh, you know, customer base. Uh, where the challenge is, is getting the utilities to allow us, or the regulators to allow us, to move our power across public rights of way. To actually be able to implement microgrids so that when the next storm comes, we can support the buildings in our region instead of them going dark. And there's a real policy challenge we're, we're currently facing. So why, why do this? Why build a microgrid? It's not for the faint of heart. This is not a simple endeavor, I would, I would argue. Um, but it produces economic value, the resiliency effect, um, and when utilities are faced with major capital expansion plans and the regulators look at that, we would like to see the regulators say to the utilities, what about a microgrid? What about distributed generation instead of a big transmission investment? 
local economy, as I mentioned earlier, when you have this asset now, it can really help support high value uh, employers in your community. I won't get into this, this is much more of a policy discussion, uh, but it's important though that the rules, these arcane rules, that frankly are thwarting innovation, efficiency, uh, opportunity, they need to be revisited. And our challenge is really more of a regulatory paradigm. It isn't a technical paradigm, it isn't even an economic issue. It's really regulatory webs that constrain us. So, um, jump through this. I would just like to share with you, so what we see though, I see great promise. We see uh, an urging, uh, a, a swell of opportunity. Both mayors, obviously our universities have, have, are, are deploying this. But now cities are acting and states are acting. These are the sandy states. They've been putting some money behind this, doing projects, investing in them. And just two days ago, a, a student at Harvard Law School released a report that you know, he's been doing some very detailed research on you know, microgrids in Massachusetts and the regulatory paradigm. And he's found that this notion that you can't move power across a public right of way without being a utility is an urban myth. So I think we've cracked the Maginot line. We are no way at the finish line. No way. This is going to be the rest of my career, another 30 years, if God living, God save the queen, I live that long. <laughs> but this is the challenge, you know, for the day. And so IDA, we work very closely with a number of, uh, of groups. Just last week, we released a report with the United Nations, the Environment Program. Peter mentioned I, I was at the Climate Summit. The UN gets this. They want to see district energy be an infrastructure investment, you know, in our emerging economies, in our, uh, our larger cities. And, uh, and so there's a very good report out. It's called the District Energy Accelerator. Uh, and at that, I'm also uh, going to leave you with a quote. I think it's up to, uh, I think it's up to us, you know, to really be the change. Uh, I won't wax too poetic on you, but I want to thank you uh, very much for your attention, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk with any of you after. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, and I hope you all appreciated that our, that our visitor did give a nod to our queen. I think that was very kind. So to, put, uh, to, to, bring, to bring the money into the equation, Sonia is going to uh, talk about uh, forms of funding. Thanks, Peter. And thanks very much to SBC for inviting me to present our project to you. I'm going to be talking about uh, LICs, particularly some features and benefits for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, uh, the financing mechanism, and what it can provide. I'll be uh, going into uh, background and describing project components, why municipalities are engaging in the project, and why are higher level governments supporting it. And then I'll be talking about some keys to success. So uh, local improvement charges, LICs, I'll be referring to it in that fashion, uh, ideally provide a program uh, that is as designed to be delivered at no net cost to the municipalities. It's paid for by participating owners, not all taxpayers. And it needs to be easy for municipalities to facilitate. Some features and benefits include that it is upfront financing by a municipality. It's transferable, which means that if an owner who has this financing wants to sell the property before it's paid off, the next owner continues remake, uh, paying the, uh, making the repayments and continues receiving the benefits. It removes a significant barrier to deep retrofits, uh, in addition to the fact that it offers a longer term than is typically available by banks or by utilities. Uh, typically, those are five-year terms. It also, because it has a longer term, matches the life of the asset 
and allows for affordability on an annual basis since uh, it's ideally designed so that if you're looking at energy and water upgrades, the savings closely match the payments. It's repaid on the property tax bill. It's not a tax, it's just paid on the bill. And, but it's treated like a tax, so it's a bit complex. And the way in which it's treated uh, that's very significant is that for any payments that are overdue, a priority lien is applied so that those payments, should the property go to a tax sale, are paid out first before the mortgage. And this provides a huge benefit in terms of the uh, in interest rate because it, it also makes it more affordable, which is then passed on to the owners. It's not a loan. The Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, states this pretty directly, and there's uh, challenges in the US uh, and, and a great deal of uh, controversy, but it's deemed to be not a loan, and this makes a huge difference to building owners. As well, it's not treated as debt on the municipal balance sheet, and it's recognized as, if it's, the financing is obtained through a general obligation bond. So the, the financing shows on the balance sheet, but then it's subtracted from the municipal debt total. So now I'm going to talk to you about the background of the project and its evolution. I was really inspired by a, a couple of mind-bending projects by Pemba Institute, uh, led by Roger Peters and his team. And they described a means by which uh, the initiative, uh, the LIC mechanism was used in Yukon territory from 1998 for PV and outlying regions and how it could be taken across Canada. So I wrote about it extensively and David Suzuki Foundation uh, hired me for two years to do an analysis of the feasibility of the mechanism for single-family dwellings, uh, develop a multi-sectoral uh, collaboration in Canada and the U.S. for all levels of government, industry, and goes, uh, including 28 municipalities which didn't hire me but were part of this collaboration, which were deeply engaged, and 22 more uh, that were interested, and this is in Ontario alone. I wrote three reports, uh, which describe the needs for the regulatory change, the rationale, financing methods in comparison to the other typical approaches that are used, and best practices for optimal program uh, design. The collaboration was significant. There were some key supporters uh, and a, a small group of us petitioned to the feds. We made a request for review of the Environmental Bill of Rights to the Environmental Commissioner. And all these presented the rationale and what was needed. And together, we really had a collaboration that brought about the regulatory change so that private property energy and water efficiency upgrades uh, could be financed by municipalities. So subsequently, as part of this project, I also encouraged the City of Toronto in their residential program and subsequently consulted to, as Peter mentioned, uh, the City of Toronto, Halifax, and Nova Scotia Department of Energy. So during all of this, I started, I was thinking, well, what's next? Where is there a need for resilience? What's needed with respect to the, the building sectors? And how are we going to collectively really manage to deliver sustainable infrastructure? And I started to look at the gaps. And one major gap that I saw was district energy. And another major gap and was uh, I was approached by a conservation authority to look at LICs for low impact development. So, because they were looking at ways to finance this for, on private properties. And a third series of gaps were, as I mentioned previously, related to the building types. So, we knew that there were some legal opinions that were developed for some commercial buildings, but there needs to be some uh, revisiting of that and clarification, and also there needs to be some new opinions that are developed in conjunction with financing and accounting sectors. 
And with respect to industrial buildings, we need to really look at the feasibility of using uh, LICs for uh, financing process energy. We know building energy is okay. We need to establish that process energy is viable. And we also need to establish that LID on brownfields is also viable. For institutional properties, while they don't pay property taxes, they're subject to payments in lieu of taxes. So let's say for hospitals and schools, it's called beds and heads. And then there's a number of partnership models, which I'll describe later. And these really need to be explored so that we have all the tools that are necessary for municipalities to engage in these kinds of projects. So now, what we're doing is an LIC, ICI, Energy, Water, LID, and District Energy Project. I'm project manager. Bob H is project manager for SBC. And S Sustainable Buildings Canada is the applicant. And I'm deeply grateful that SBC is taking this on. And with Bob's uh, huge collaboration, it's a huge amount of in-kind support that they're providing and we have some pretty significant team members. So Peter Love, former Chief Energy Conservation Officer for Ontario, Bill Johnston, past President of the Toronto Real Estate Board and current Director of the Canadian Real Estate Association is participating. He's contributing 20,000 in, in kind. And we have an esteemed municipal lawyer and academic who's Stanley McCooch, who's referred by Brent Gilmore, who is formerly with CUI. And so the team is, uh, these uh, three, Peter, Bill, and, and Stan, were, have been involved in, this in the project concept and in the development of the, uh, looking at you know, what was needed for the reg change and, and really a burgeoning interest and participation over almost four years. So with respect to the partnership models that we'll be addressing, we really have a, a very strong complement of municipalities that are deeply engaged. We have uh, three municipalities uh, and their conservation authorities uh, that are aiming towards pilots, of which two are single tier and one is upper tier. One municipality that's lower tier is listening in. And just last week, we uh, have uh, had interest expressed by an LDC that is interested in listening in with one of its municipalities and eventually developing a framework for lower tier municipalities that cross a number of upper tier boundaries. The kinds of measures we'll be including are energy and water conservation upgrades, renewable energy system retrofits, uh, district energy system expansion, and private property connections. Well, we knew that we wouldn't really be looking at funding the entire system, but we were really working together to see what the municipalities were needing and arrived at this for the district energy systems. And then we're uh, addressing low impact development measures to uh, um, address the 90th percentile rain event. And that came from the municipalities as we were developing the project. It initially started with energy and water and I wanted them to think about what kind of district energy uh, possibilities they would, they would want to uh, take on. So with respect to the building types, for the feasibility study, we're addressing commercial. Uh, and uh, we're not looking at MERBs. Um, we're addressing industrial buildings, uh, institutional buildings. And we're piloting commercial and potentially industrial buildings, depending on the outcomes of the feasibility study. For the project activities, they will cover three years. Uh, we'll be establishing the, the Legal Financial Accounting Authority. We'll be delivering uh, an LIC program design uh, for buildings. We'll also be delivering something that's, uh, th there's a lot of new pieces to this uh, initiative. And that is a means by which the owners can uh, reduce their required rates of return, and lengthen the investment horizons, which typically the opposite happens in the absence of risk mitigation strategies. So this was discussed um, actually in, by a previous uh, presenter, not on this panel, but earlier. 
And another piece that's really making us quite excited is that we will be presenting a value impacts framework on the impacts uh, on value of deep retrofit measures in advance of the decision to invest. Then, of course, we'll be uh, delivering a framework design uh, for the district energy system expansion and connections and supporting the municipalities through the pilots. We'll also, of course, um, deliver a broader market demand and industry capacity analysis, and then subsequently a local analysis will be taking place down the road. So why are municipalities engaging in this project? Well, as I mentioned at the outset, this kind of program needs to be easy to administer. It needs to be designed to be delivered at zero net cost to the municipality. Only municipalities can provide the mechanism and the associated benefits, and it addresses municipal targets. What kinds of targets? Well, these particular municipalities are really developed, I mean, they've, uh, municipalities have to deliver uh, very comprehensive plans, and these are aimed at, uh, of course, reducing energy and water use, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, addressing the, the 90th percentile rainfall, reducing pressure on energy, water, wastewater infrastructure, uh, stormwater infrastructure, uh, reducing climate change risks and impacts. We've been hearing about the cost impacts. Uh, enhancing uh, building stock quality, uh, delivering financing for these kinds of measures for private uh, buildings in the ICI sector. And we'll be uh, comparing LID approaches uh, to achieve those uh, goals, the addressing of the 90th percentile rainfall. We'll be providing uh, societal benefits that really on scaling up will be much more magnified, but we know that there are definitely also health and, and job uh, quantifications that have been happening, and we anticipate being able to uh, measure those. And of course, uh, once we address LID, we'll be looking to see, uh, um, to expect benefits such as habitat restoration and enhanced water quality. Now, municipalities can deliver on these targets uh, independent, you know, and what's really um, critical about having a program such as this is that banks don't have these kinds of targets. Banks focus on the ability to repay, and so even, you know, if a bank was interested in, in having a very substantive uh, um, program to, to finance upgrades, they, un, un, unless, you know, hopefully maybe 10 years down the road or less than that, banks may have that as goals. They may partner with municipalities more than they currently do. But a couple of years ago, I sat in a meeting with uh, one of the big five uh, bankers and I heard and I was with the municipal rep and we almost fell off our chairs because the bank basic, the bank rep said that they didn't care about GHGs and they didn't care about energy use reduction. All they cared about was the ability to repay. And I saw this in a brochure from another of the big five banks. So it was um, pretty meaningful. And of course, uh, a major municipal goal is the increase uh, in green jobs and uh, addressing and, and providing for a local economic multiplier because people who uh, obtain local contracts spend locally. Benefits to businesses include enhanced building performance, reduction in hardened soft costs, uh, that they can invest independent of their expected tenure. So this allows deeper retrofits. Um, it removes the barriers to deep retrofits, which um, by providing low cost financing, by uh, providing a value impact framework so they can anticipate what, they may, what the benefits may be of the investment before they actually uh, make those decisions. And they can obtain, as I mentioned before, the longer investment horizons and the lower required rates of return that are associated with strategies to mitigate risk. They can decrease their own climate change risks. They can provide, they can obtain supports for scaling up. And of course, this addresses ESG, environmental and social governance. So why are higher level governments supporting LIC programs? 
They provide savings on externalized costs to taxpayers, which include uh, infrastructure costs, healthcare costs, environmental impacts, unemployment expenses, and of course the benefits also include increases in income tax revenues because of the industry stimulus and uh, uh, from the increased employment and mitigation of climate change. So how, uh, what are some ways in which we seek to uh, mitigate resistance to uptake? Well, some keys to, uh, to success include really mitigating stakeholders' risks. Not just one stakeholder, and not just, let's say, the municipality stakeholder risks compared, uh, and it's not a transfer of risk. Uh, this was one thing that really kind of hit out at me this morning. It's not a transfer. It's we're seeking to mitigate everybody's risks because once that happens, then you really uh, have an opportunity to enhance uptake. And so, for instance, for residential programs, the cluster of best practices include a focus on energy savings, uh, access to highly skilled personnel, delivering a turnkey program, delivering on cost-effective measures, very strong QAQC, um, very strong MMV, and uh, stringent eligibility criteria. So I'm going to end with a quote as well. And this is from Bill Johnston and, uh, you know, he says it all. Thank you so much. Well, there we go. And we've got about half an hour. I, I, I do thank Sonia for leading into my, um, my, uh, comment or t leading on my comment to to Nick that you know if it was a financial discussion there'd be long words and acronyms so I did write down that we learned about LICs for LIDs on ICIs with LDCs for DES and ESG am I right or what I didn't see Nick writing anything down which I think you know we'll have to it, it's up there is it okay so the, the, there are a lot of themes that come through from this morning and this afternoon and this panel about the integration of thinking, um, the idea of the complexity, and there's, there's, uh, there are lots of uh, simple, powerful, and wrong answers. Um, and I, but I think we've got enough questions. And, and the, the other idea about that a lot of this has been about changing regulatory environment. And the two words that I've heard um, absurd and arcane, I think lead us to perhaps a need for understanding this collaboration idea. How did we get to the state we're in now becomes a very compelling story for the people who need to change the state. I think there's a lot of youngsters here who have no idea how we got to where we got. And there's a lot of guys with ancient guys like me who also have no idea how we got where we got. So it'd be good to have those um, tribal stories about how we ended up with the regulatory environment that prevents us from achieving uh, district energy or local improvement charges or um, integrated uh, green strategies connecting uh, blue and green or um, more, more thoughtful infrastructure decision making. So I, I challenge all of you to start thinking about capturing the lessons about how some of those things uh, arrived where we are, because as we backcast and try and figure out how we want to change them, it always helps to move the people in the room if you can agree on a common story about how, where we, how we got where we got. So with that in mind, do you have some questions of the panel that uh, we can get their thoughts on? Bob? Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, Bob. I've... Thanks, Yuri. Um, 
sense of urgency, and I'll, I'll just preface that with a conversation we had at lunch about how we are continually bombarded with numbers that are about quantity, but we have no story about rate. And the reality is that when we're talking about resilience, systems can deal with all sorts of large changes as long as they're slow enough. But I think what we're dealing with is very fast, very large changes. So with that in mind, and, and, and I think Yuri's point is that, that we're, we've, we're, we're probably at a tipping point whether we're either going to move this large needle or not. And perhaps um, we'll start, you would like to, uh, Henry would like to uh, start here, which is great. I'd like to say yes. There is a sense of urgency, Nina Marie. Uh, but I'd also like to say that human design systems of institutional governance are among the slowest to change. And so until we compellingly speak to our own ability to change the systems that we ultimately designed, it becomes a very difficult case to make, particularly given that the scale of problem is seen by most people as unapproachable. It is seen as out of their domain of control. And so we, I think we need stories that bring the capacity of change to our doorstep, that individuals make a difference. And so the emphasis on small uh, individual projects that are connected in behavior and in tactic becomes really important. So working at multiple scales. I also think, in, at least in, and have said many times in my own work, that we have enough knowledge to act now. We really do. But we also need to monitor the kinds of responses that we make. Um, for example, in the case of coastal defense strategies or in the case of um, you know, connecting habitat for the purpose of land banking, CO2 banking and so on. We can monitor those, those uh, things. That's what academics do. We, we you know, find innovative ways to learn from that. But we need to feed that learning into an institutional system that responds to it. That, that chain doesn't exist very often. This analogy of throwing something over your head and hoping that it whacks someone in the head to pay attention, I think really does need to change. That's why we, I think a lot of us are pracademics. We study, we research, we act, and we communicate. And we don't, we cannot do that in isolation. So organizations like this or emphasis on collaboration are necessary, but the collaborating not just the emphasis on it, is the important part. Most of you who work in municipal government, just for one example, know how difficult it is to make very simple infrastructural changes when you can't get the right person in one siloed agency at your table. Everyone knows that frustration. So sometimes the smaller scale simple problems can, or simple um, projects, can lead to learning that's communicated. Oh, we, we did this in spite of an institutional bureaucracy, not because of it. Yeah, I, w I would add, um, I think those are some great points, uh, that when we can hit home uh, what it means to the, what I would say, the average person who doesn't think about some of these things, about their infrastructure systems uh, in my industry in particular on a daily basis. Uh, so we're doing some work in Hamilton to try and uh, engage the citizens in those discussions and, and speak in numbers that they understand, you know, Billions and millions are abstract numbers to a lot of people who uh, don't own houses and uh, you know are, are on the fringes of society. So we really try and and, and educate uh, the public so that it becomes urgent for them, uh, because ultimately, until uh, you know, I think the word grassroots or the phrase grassroots probably gets used a little too much. Uh, these days, but it really needs to be the collective efforts uh, of everyone uh, pushing uh, our society in the direction we want to go. And I think that, that that's happening. Um, and so I think we just need to uh, keep the uh, foot on the pedal, so to speak. The frameworks that we're developing are um, a, a staged approach. The municipalities that are engaged in this project uh, have been knowledgeable about LICs and the possibilities for some years now. And it, what we're working to do is to bring other municipalities into the game and, and educate it. And so, um, and already the ones, you know, one of the ones that's, cons that's uh, interested in listening in is talking about when they're going to pilot. So the idea would be to you know, develop these, these frameworks, share them at specific points, 
And so that allows the municipalities to, uh, in turn, educate um, their own stakeholders. And so we're, it's a strategic approach that we're taking to, to uh, deliver something that's this staged. And uh, so I want to commend Sonia for the work she's doing, because I think, I think that's the WD-40 that will lubricate a lot of projects. That's really the missing link is sort of enabling, you know, these projects to be funded. Yeah, I, I'm a little frustrated. I think there's a lot of talk. I've been at, in clean energy since 1978. Jimmy Carter, the moral equivalent of war. I did research on you know, the greenhouse effect. And, but at the same time, I'm encouraged. So last week, I was in New York, and I saw 400,000 people marching across Manhattan, literally with, you know, committed to making this change. Now, you know, there are some vested, powerful interests uh, that are keen for status quo. The fossil lobby, Wall Street, your incumbent electric utility, they're not keen on this change. Um, but I think the crisis of Sandy has given mayors a backbone, and I see you know, community leaders saying, damn it, we're not satisfied with what we have Things need to change, and I want what Princeton has, and why can't I have it? So I'm kind of encouraged that, uh, you know, the C40 cities we're working with, the UN we're working with, we're working really, and we're in the echo chamber, people are now, city leaders are coming to us, how do we do a, a really robust, resilient energy asset in our city? So, uh, you know, I wasn't joking, you know, the balance of my career, I'm going to continue doing this for the next 20, well, maybe, who, long, who knows. Uh, but I did listen, when I was at the General Assembly, I sat and listened to 30 heads of state talk about climate change, and I thought to myself, well, I've heard this song before. But at the same time, I am encouraged, and I would all, urge all of you to Google, Dear Matafele Painum, M-A-T-A-F-E F-E-L-E-P-E-N-E-M. Dear Matafele Painem. Just Google uh, Marshall Island Poet UN. Watch it. It'll make it real for you. I'll try and post the uh, URL up here. Um, th thanks, thanks, Rob. The um, one thing you did say in your, in your talk that I think might give you some encouragement, and, and there's a growing sense that this is, this is not a technical problem. It used to be, well, there's a vested interest in trying to make science wrong and technology wrong, but we have the solutions. And I think the idea that each of you have talked about is telling stories and success stories are a pow powerful influence on action. So as we move from, from uh, talking about collaborating or the, 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 the mumble that, that Nina Maurice talked about to actually collaborating, and I think that feeds into the slide that that uh, Nick gave us on the research showing that the most sustainable infrastructure resides in the municipalities that have the most collaborative structure. And that, so there, you tell those stories and it starts m moving the yardsticks. But the flip side of all of that is that a lot of times we count on our government governments to be the regulatory agency that slows down some things because as we saw in 2007, 2008, the unregulated financial system can get way ahead of you. And in Canada, where we had a little more structure to it, it saved us from that. So we're, we're asking for two things, really. We're asking them for, for government to get their head out of grandfather's grid. And we're, but on the same time, we're wanting them to manage uh, things in a, in a way that doesn't uh, change too quickly. So there's obviously a, a balance, and to Yuri's point, I think we have to start getting more serious about how uh, close we are to a tipping point. And while there's, while there's still far more money being spent trying to run science down for the interests of the power companies and whoever else, um, the, the rest of us have to start building science up, I think. Got a question in the middle here? I won't give your name wrong, so. Yeah, okay, I'm Robin Hutchison, and uh, I just wanted to pick up on the district energy discussion and share with you something that's going on in Canada that people here in the East probably are quite aware of. 
Uh, my partners out in Vancouver who are specialists in low temperature district energy systems, they designed the, uh, the system that's in Whistler, British Columbia. And I just wanted to share with you the power of district energy systems that during the Winter Olympics, when people are probably up at all hours during that time, that they were able to heat the building from the heat recovered from the, from the wastewater treatment plant and didn't have to run the boilers. So that's just one element that shows you uh, the power of what a district energy system can do. I like to use the term that it shares resources and has the potential to eliminate waste. And then the second point to this is that they've developed technology to take gray water to be able to inject it into the district energy system because we're talking about an ambient system and then reintroduce it into the buildings for sewage conveyance. So now you have a convergence of energy and water in the same infrastructure. So this is what's going on in Canada and uh, so there are elements of hope. Great story, thank you. Whistler District Energy. Tom? Uh, yeah, Tom Vanessa, Sustainable Buildings Canada. Uh, Will, I don't know if you're still here, he had a great little story at the end when uh, I was talking to him after the last presentation. <clears throat> and he said there was a, a neighborhood where the people um, were, I guess, uh, the subjects of, a, of a, an LID uh, pilot project. And they said, it works a charm. And I think that's, like, that's the pincer movement. That's the other side, from the uh, grassroots up where you can get change because then they tell their neighbors, they tell the other neighborhoods, their taxpayers, their voters. So, you know, something on the ground that works that everybody can buy into, then, you know, Fox News is bullshit, you know. <laughs> it's, it's people living it. And I think that's one of the great drivers too. Thank you. Is there a question in there that I can ask the panel? <laughs> Help me out here. Tom. I just want to say here, here to the Fox News thing. <laughs> I'm with you, Tom. We'll share our queen with you if you keep your Fox News. <laughs> there we go. Hi, uh, Marilee Swillamsey with Dillon Consulting, and I'm wondering if any of the panelists have examples of how projects have been properly communicated and educated to people. So. One of the things that's really interesting is even in this example with the district energy is people walk by these things all the time and have no idea the contribution that they're making. And same with the conversation about 80% of the assets are underground. Are there ways that are creative, look great from a design perspective, but that also educate the, re the, the regular public and not just talking about going into schools and talking to kids, but actually voters and citizens who are not in this room who don't understand and don't realize that the, the things that are being built around them are contributing to the greater good and, and benefiting society in the long term. Great question, thank you. Um, so uh, I think our friends in Europe are much better at this than we are. You know, they, I think you know, a more collective society, it's, it's easier. They, they feel invested in it. The we uh, he's referring to is the US? Just yeah, well, <laughs> true, true. I can't change my orientation, I'm afraid. No, I think there's an interesting difference in, in no, Canada. Yeah, We're so somewhere in between. A more collective yeah. society. And, I, and I, would, I would agree that Canada is a more collective society, you know, certainly than the U.S. Um, but, you know, one of the things we're trying to do at IDA, we, we are really trying to reach the younger generation, you know, the kids. We want district energy to be like the cool kids' table in the cafeteria, right? <laughs> we want them to sort of, you know, get it. So we've been uh, having like a video contest uh, at our colleges and universities, tell us why district energy is cool you know, through the sustainability, we've been doing that for a couple of years, and so the kids are like, hey, my school's cooler than yours, you know, we're using waste energy and we're using biomass. So I think the next generation really, you know, I was, I was one of those kids. I thought that solar and wind was gonna, you know, change the world, and it's great, I'm all for it, but it's not all that we need to really move our economy, right? So um, I don't know that we have enough resources, that's a heavy lift, educating, you know, everybody. Um, and, you know, I'd love for someday to be able to, you know, do more of that. But I think we're starting to see a lot more attention you know, in the blogs, much more sort of visibility uh, for the district energy sector anyway. Um, but I think it's a, you know, at a local level, uh, you know, if you're going to do a project, you've got to be prepared to have a lot of meetings and a lot of ham sandwiches and really, you know, uh, expose 
the, uh, you know, the whole project. It takes time. Nina Marie? Thanks, yeah, Rob. It's a, an excellent question that you raised that goes to this issue of making legible and visible the work that we do. So much of the infrastructure isn't. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for us to think about how to advertise to the everyday taxpayer, citizen, contributing member of our community what something as nerdy as infrastructure does. And so by, I think, in, in, in the t from a tax point of view, when you're communicating with ratepayers, uh, it certainly helps to not take the sort of bean counting approach to communicating that we have in the past. And so much of this is a factor of our institutional systems of governance that result in having, you know, people in one department communicating something that they're used to communicating, which is essentially internal, the example of using all these acronyms and no one, I didn't know what anybody was talking about. So for example, we now, even in planning education, teach visual communication that we never used to teach. We have integrated courses where we bring uh, systems design engineers together with civil engineers, together with urban planners, together with landscape architects, and ask them to communicate the same problem to each other. Understanding that explaining how a piece of infrastructure works often requires different tactics. Um, we, I can't think of an example um, in a particular municipality here where the communication of an investment has been part of the upfront cost of building it. Maybe that's something we think about. If you look at, for example, Dutch water programs, with every tax bill that a Dutch citizen gets, from the time they're a child, they understand what their water infrastructure is doing. In that context, it's a very different uh, reality. If the Oosterschelte Dam fails, um, people die. So there is this communication of the infrastructure and every drop of water being really powerfully important in the life story of a citizen. We have none of that. We have this incredible separation. And we might think in, our, in the way we do business, not only with our municipal clients if we're in the private sector, but um, the way we, we work with our, our neighboring colleague has to do with communicating differently. And that only happens when we sit at a table and try to understand the problems uh, that we're working on together. So that, that collaboration piece sounds like such a, you know, an intangible, and it's absolutely critical. So if I ask Nick to draw me a flowchart of how one of his projects work, it's going to look different than if I do it. But I'll bet you, after 20, 10 minutes in discussing it, we can find a way to communicate it to somebody in a different discipline much better. For sure. The other thing I would add is that I think we need to focus more on educating and communicating, uh, re not relating specifically to the infrastructure itself, but the service that it provides. So infrastructure is a conduit of the service, and people respond to that uh, discussion. Um, you know, I heard Lou DiGeronimo talking about all this traffic uh, congestion in Toronto related to water main renewal programs and said, well, it's great because at the end of the day, people in Toronto are going to have nice new infrastructure and people don't care about that. What he needs to say, in my opinion, is that people are going to have improved water service, more reliable water service and less service disruptions or less traffic delays caused by water main breaks. So the, the asset management industry within municipalities is starting to, to pivot towards managing services. City of London is going to what they call service-based budgets, um, so not trying to align line items with uh, the actual infrastructure itself, but the service that it provides. And I think that's a good Smart. step uh, to start communicating that uh, to our, uh, I guess you can say, the broader public. There's a great example um, of an initiative in Halifax uh, it's an ocean inlet water cooling project, and I don't know if it was if the marketing of it was financed at the outset because that's an excellent idea. Uh, however, it's pretty well marketed, and I was surprised uh, to hear how much of the community is aware of the initiative. And one more thing to add, uh, so there's this concept of public information centers in my business, so we have environmental assessments and we have to have these things that we refer to as PICs. A chance to engage with the public to show them what we're trying to do uh, and what infrastructure we're planning on building them. And there's kind of a running joke, you know, you ask someone how their PIC went and, and a good PIC is one where no one shows up <laughs> because it, it was easy. Nobody asks you a tough question. Um, and so I think that we need to get beyond that and looking at public engagement that isn't this sort of uh, typical way that engineers have been forced to do it through the Environmental Assessment Act, to check it off the list to say, yeah, here's my notice we met and here's my sign-in sheet had four people uh, that were actually trying to engage people who will be impacted by those discussions uh, and the infrastructure services. Toronto has basement flooding PICs all the time. I don't think most people know that they're happening in their ward unless your basement's been flooded. Uh, you won't bother going. So I think we need to engage beyond the, the typical approach that we've taken. 
One other fast example. Um, in a, an infrastructure project that I've been working on in the American West and that, that's modeled on the Canadian wildlife crossings in Banff, um, we actually budgeted up front in a process of um, this infrastructure project to have an exhibit around it that was uh, interactive and that used a, a mobile handheld application to explain to people what was happening over and above the road as they passed by. And it was a, styled as a game. Um, and in fact, we even asked the, asked the designers, the engineer and the landscape architect, to conceive, how do you make this bridge tell a story? How does it communicate not what the bridge is, but what it's doing? What's the value added service? So what animals are crossing the road? How many people are not involved in a vehicular collision because of this thing? So even just the way we commission these projects might have built into them uh, an, ex an exploratory factor that says, well, tell us what, what you're getting for this. Um, and it's a really important point that we don't need to talk about the thing itself, but what, it, what does it do? It's an excellent point. I kind of expected this to go, at least in Nina Marie's case, in terms of things like the World Wildlife Fund is trying, spending a lot of effort getting us to understand the uh, economic value of nature. And so... Um, I think if there's a parallel conversation showing the economic value or the societal value of uh, infrastructure, as, as Nina Marie was calling it, they've converged. If we just talk about them generically as, as infrastructure and start showing what trees give us and what rivers give us and what um, sewers give us and talk about that value, then we may get somewhere. So great question and a lot of thought-provoking answers. Tacky. Seconds. Uh, I did some work, uh, Rob, with uh, N-Wave, um, and a fantastic project, reducing electricity consumption for air conditioning by 90%, taking thousands of cars off the road. Wonderful stories about this natural cooling, uh, lake-based cooling system, and we were having some difficulty getting people excited or interested, so we thought we'd go big, um, and uh, we would get Robert Kennedy Jr. to come up and and launch it, and we had Alec Baldwin, and had a fantastic event, and actually got some media publicity, except the publicity quickly turned to municipal government wasting money, bringing up celebrities for <laughs> municipal boondoggle. And I mean, this wonderful, fantastic project, unique in the world, got so easily sidelined by just that kind of, uh, uh, of a shift, and it just speaks volumes to the importance of strategic communication uh, in the development and engagement of local citizens about what really these projects represent and the benefits that they do bring. So, word of the wise. Yeah, yeah it's, how much, it's how much time the press will give to anybody who wants to bitch about something, right? Talk well, about umbrellas or? Well, uh, I, would, I would just add that, you know, sort of the, this media news cycle and the, um, I don't know, the ravenous uh, approach for, you know, uh, I don't know, um, scandal, scandal as opposed yeah. to story you know, I mean, so you have to have your, you know, you have to be wearing your waders when you get into the waters with the media. Um, but um, what's little known as well about the N-Wave project is that recently it was sold to a private entity and the city garnered a hundred million dollars in value gain, hundred million dollars in profit uh, from the sale of their share of N-Wave. You know, that didn't actually, so when they were talking about the expense for Alec Baldwin, I don't know that they picked up the, you know, the good news at this end. So, you know, it really is a very successful and recognized project. Yes, in the front here. For sure, and the best thing about the control panel is that it allows you to see what you're currently, what services or what level of service is currently being provided, and the ability to, to try and quantify what it's going to take to improve service levels. 
Because everyone says, oh, we need to improve basement flooding, but is it basement flooding or is it uh, water that's flowing into Lake Ontario and, and trying to clean up the harbor? Hamilton is spending the single largest capital project in the city of Hamilton's existence is six, $550 million on tertiary treatment at their wastewater treatment plant and it's to improve water quality in Hamilton Harbor. Great initiative, uh, but at the same time, they still have huge basement flooding problems in their city, which aren't gonna be uh, fixed uh, by their tertiary treatment problem. So there is, you know, what is their priority? And I don't think that's, you know, obviously there's no easy answer to that, but I agree. It, the quantifying, what it's gonna take to improve services is one of the best parts about that dashboard as well. And, and you are exposing people to their foibles when you put a dashboard in. You've got to build them up, build some confidence up. If I were TTC and I was getting my on-time performance rated, I think the dashboard's the last thing I need. But, uh, well, you might be, but... Well, that, okay, well, there's the issue. I mean, you, you just, but that story of how getting other people who've put dashboards in and didn't die on them, and, and telling those stories about how they have improved life is, is really a, uh, going back to the same theme of telling stories of success. So is, that, is there any other question? One last one before the break here at the back. Attacking your old grid system? Well, the sort of the implications of solar flare and, you know, the impact of that, it's a little beyond my pay grade, frankly. I, I understand it to, a, to some limit. Um, I think it does expose sort of the, you know, the larger grid to uh, interruption. I think that a microgrid, you know, wouldn't be impervious to it. It would probably be exposed to it as well. Uh, but sort of having a more localized asset base with generation nearby, you know, it, it, you know I think it stands to reason that uh, that asset could be, uh, remedied and restored more quickly. We, we see that during other events where, um, you know, a university will actually isolate, disconnect from the grid. Uh, they, oftentimes, they don't have enough capacity to serve the whole campus. They, they triage that. They know in advance they're going to serve the cancer research laboratory, uh, you know, the critic, mission critical, the hospital, and then, uh, and then they sort of they ride through. So I think with a, you know, if we were exposed to, you know, sort of this, you know, the solar flare, um, uh, I, I think they, they could be maybe more responsive for their uh, segment. Thank you, Rob. Um, how about a hand for the panel and their excellent uh, presentations? <laughs> Thank you very much. I guess I should have said many hands for the panel, so um, appreciated. Uh, my job is to, I think, send you off for coffee, but I better read the notes here. Um, oh, man, a guy who knows what he's doing. There's a change for you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you Peter, and thanks, uh, thanks to all of our esteemed panelists here for uh, sharing your experiences and insights. Um, I know that SBC is proud to um, provide this particular soapbox for you people to tell your um, very interesting stories. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, announce the tour that we'll take a short break. I'd like to thank our uh, afternoon uh, break sponsors and my employers, actually, the Oz Group of Companies, for their ongoing sponsorship over the years and for the sponsorship of this break. And if I could ask everyone to return to your seats for 3.30, uh, go out and grab some coffee and some sugar. Thank you very much.